Hello, I'm Dallas Grove. Welcome to our Hometown History, a show that brings the history of coastal Monmouth County to life, sometimes through the stories of its people, and sometimes through the exhibits and happenings of the Township of Ocean Historical Museum. This is the Eden Woolley House, the museum's home. It's a fully restored 250-year-old structure that's an open door to history. These galleries and exhibits and a year-round calendar of events that open the door to our regional paths. We invite you to check out our website, oceanmuseum.org, and come see for yourself. Our volunteers, and we are an all-volunteer organization, are waiting to greet you. But right now, we invite you to join us in this episode of Hometown History. Hi, I'm Peggy Dellinger. I'm the exhibit director here at the Eden Woolley House, home of the Ocean Township Historical Museum. Right now, I'm in the Richmond Gallery, which is in the, the room of the Eden Woolley House, in which we put a changing exhibit. The exhibit changes about once a year, and it's my job to take down the old and put in the new. And in a few days, I'll be back here in the Richmond Gallery putting in the new exhibit. And we thought that uh, it would be a fitting farewell to the current exhibit if we were to document it and share it with you. So I'd like to take the next few minutes to walk you through the gallery, and in walking you through the gallery, tell the story of this exhibit, which is called The History of Houses and the Things That Make Them Home. From the beginning, home has been about much more than shelter. Remember those cave paintings? Where we live expresses our taste, our social status, even our values. From the bare bones, one room houses of those early colonists to the too many rooms to name McMansions of today, houses tell a story. The colonists built houses like the ones they left behind. The founding fathers emulated the Greeks and Romans whose rationality they admired. Victorians couldn't get enough of the goods and ornaments made possible by the Industrial Revolution and made available by the railroads. And the modernists rejected the ornamentation and exploited new materials and building techniques. The homes that resulted, distinguished by how they are shaped, trimmed, and constructed, surround us. Our neighborhoods abound with homes that, if our eyes are prepared to see, tell much in their diversity about where we've been and where we're headed. This little model here is an example of a colonial home. And um, as I mentioned, the colonists came here from the old world, bringing with them the taste and know-how of the shelter that, and homes that they remembered back in the old world. Here in New Jersey, many of our colonists came from England and from the Netherlands, and we see a lot of that uh, English and, and Dutch architectural style in the homes around us still today. This model demonstrates some of the features of that British colonial style. It's very classical in its symmetry. It has a steeped roof, which was very handy to have the snow fall off here in the colder winters of New Jersey and in New England. And you'll notice the, the kind of iconic small pane glasses of the windows. And that's because in, uh, until the 1700, about 1700, the colonies were forbidden from doing any manufacturing of glass. All glass was imported. It was hard to make and easy to break and very expensive and taxed by the British when it was imported. So the idea of putting in small panes was just a very practical solution to that hard to come by commodity. When the colonists came here, they adapted uh, to the materials and to the climate that they found. So most of our colonial homes in this area are built of wood. As you move into Pennsylvania, you'll see more stone being used. But this little model helps us explain what that colonial home was like. The interesting thing is that uh, politics have a, a profound influence on what our houses look like and how we live, as well as other forces that we'll be talking about a little bit later. So one of the obviously seminal events in our political history was the American Revolution. So we've just described the colonial home, and the American Revolution made the concept and the word colonial somewhat out of fashion. The new independent country didn't want to be thinking of itself as colonial. They didn't want to be thinking of themselves as English. So they began to look around for another model for many things, including their architecture, and they settled on the Greeks and Romans. 
which is not surprising because the Greeks, in fact, had the most successful democracy up to that time in the history of the world. So you see that our most iconic American houses, when you think about it, are built in this neoclassical style. Monticello, which is this model in front of us, but also think about the White House and think about Mount Vernon. They're all classical examples of this uh, Greek or Federalist style. If you look at the Monticello model, you'll see the characteristic factors that make it neoclassical, and in this case, federal. The roof is not like the colonial roof. It has a much more shallow slope to it. It's like the colonial house, very symmetrical. In fact, when you think about it, the colonial house was also in the classical mode, just much simpler. When you look at this model, it's much more ornately adorned. But again, the front door is in the center. It's very symmetrical. Uh, the windows are uh, symmetrically placed on either side of the front door. There's ornamentation and a pediment above the front door looking very Greek in, it, in its style. You see the fan windows and the circular windows and the circular rotunda, all of which were very characteristic of this style. Jefferson himself designed this house. He lived there for 54 years and never stopped designing and redesigning it. As a matter of fact, this rotunda that we think of as, as the signature look of Monticello actually was not there in the beginning. It was a different facade. Jefferson spent some time as our ambassador in France where he saw some of the structures in the Greek and Roman classical style and he particularly of an architect called Palladio he came back and tore down the front of his Monticello and rebuilt this one that we know in the model of the the uh, Palladio so he lived there for 54 years he has many inventions there were little privies in there he had doors that swung open automatically pushed on one and the adjacent door opened with it he had uh, hidden staircases. He was just a very inventive man beyond what we know of him in his authorship of the Declaration of Independence. He was a skilled architect and an inventor. In this home, we can really tell the story of our, our, our early history as an independent country and the ideals to which we aspire. And it's here because, once again, we're showing that how we live and what our homes look like express more than our tastes, they express our values. And in this case, this neoclassical style was expressing the values of the Greek democracy, the discipline of the symmetry, the exactness of all the mathematical formulas that went into devising the trim and, and the layout of the home. Here we have the example of a Victorian house. And uh, the Victorian period is named for Queen Victoria of England, who reigned from 1837 to 1901, a good long 60 plus years and exerted an uh, influence on a lot of things that were still with us today, including the Victorian style home. We can think of Ocean Grove and Cape May and many wonderful examples here right in our own neighborhood. It's arguably said that it was during this Victorian period, the last three quarters of the 19th century, that how we lived domestically, our domestic life, changed more than any other time in human history which might be a surprising statement to make because we think about the 20th century and we think about computers and television and we think, well, that's a lot of change. But when you think back to the 19th century, we're talking about fundamental stuff that radically shifted our homes and how we lived in them. And when you look at this Victorian model and think back on the Monticello model and the colonial house that we started with, you see some very vivid contrast, vivid being the operative word. It's pink and it's purple and it's asymmetrical and it has many roof slants. It has porches, it has doodads, it has shutters. It has railings and all kinds of little trim. And the question becomes, what was it that was going on in this country that made us shift so much in our taste and how we lived? And the question is really answered by a number of things. Probably foremost among the answers is the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, being powered by James Watt's steam engine, put workers into factories and began to produce goods, uh, mass produce goods, in quantities that made them cheap uh, enough or affordable enough for the masses, not just the rich. At the same time, that 
same steam engine was powering the locomotive and the railroad was being built across the country. And so you had this confluence of factors where men, mostly men, were going back to work into the factory. So for the first time in our history, we were really separating home life from work. Think about farmers and so many craftsmen who really worked for centuries inside their home or very near their home. For the first time, you had people leaving their home to go to work. They were being given wages that gave them a disposable income. And at the same time, you had factories producing goods, the railroads delivering those goods. And so you have a Victorian era in which enough was never enough and they couldn't get enough of everything. So there, you look at this model and you just see lots of everything, lots of ornamentation, lots of rooms. I have to remind you that when we go back to that colonial house, which was quite grand as you think about it, when you think that most of our four uh, fathers here in Ocean Township, for example, started out in humble little one-room dwellings, including the Eden Woolley House in which we're standing, started as a one-room dwelling, that the idea was that without central heating in our particular climate, the family was huddled around the fireplace to keep warm for much of the year, certainly huddled around the fireplace to cook, and it, became, it was the center of life. The Victorians were relieved from all of that because it was in the mid-1800s that we invented radiators and steam heat. So for the first time in history, people living in homes had central heating. And central heating made all the difference because no longer did the family have to stay huddled around the fireplace. They were able to go to separate rooms. So the Victorians, those folks who could never get too much of anything, decided that rooms were a really good idea. And so they invented them. They had rooms that were libraries, rooms for music, rooms for billiards, rooms for waiting, rooms for meeting people. They had bedrooms, dressing rooms, sitting rooms, butler pantries. There was just a proliferation of rooms. During this 19th century, you have the mass production of goods, you have central heating coming in, and even creating the notion of privacy. Because when you live in a one-room dwelling, or even a two- or three-room dwelling, there isn't much privacy to be had. So with central heating, you had separate rooms, and with separate rooms, you had privacy. So the whole concept of living in comfort and living private lives was made possible during this era. The next thing that had this profound effect on our domestic life was indoor plumbing. And it was during this century that you saw really the proliferation of water being pumped from uh, municipal systems into homes. And by the end of the century, you had the invention of flush toilets, which were really perfected uh, early in the 20th century. And then the, the, the last uh, thing that I would mention to make my case that this was the most profound change in how we live at home was the introduction of electric light. Before this, in, in the models that we saw at Monticello and the, and, the, and the colonial model, all work was done by candlelight or by oil lamp. And basically, life rose and set with the sun. And people who were working basically needed the sunlight. As a matter of fact, in that colonial home, uh, people took their furniture from room to room. The rooms were generally not specialized. They carried the furniture with them following the sun for both warmth and light. So you can imagine what a liberation it was to suddenly be able to turn a switch. Early in the 19th century, you had gaslight. And gaslight was certainly a quantum leap improvement over candles and oil lamps. But gas was dangerous and gas was dirty. Uh, a lot of the dark colors on the Victorian rooms, uh, the, the wallpaper and the furniture that you see was, was designed to hide a lot of the soot that came off of the gas lights. But and later in the, in, in the century, they were able to replace their gas lights with electric lights. So you can really make the case that that the Victorian era was really a turning point in houses and home life. You know, it's a little bit intimidating to do um, an exhibit all about houses because every one of us was born and brought up and continued to live in a home. So that makes us all experts on the topic. And what we tried to do in putting this exhibit together was to ask our guests to come in and look at something that's as familiar to them as anything in their lives. 
their homes, the rooms in them, and, and ask them to look at them through a new lens and begin to question, well, why is it that way? Why does the house look the way it looks on the outside? And why does it look the way it looks on the inside? So the next part of the exhibit, having just talked about the exterior of houses, looking at three kind of basic models, the colonial, the neoclassic, and the Victorian, we move now into looking inside the house. And we're going to examine the rooms of the house. Now, I mentioned before, it started very simple. When we talked about rooms in the earliest days of the Eden Woolley House or of our colonial settlers, very often we were talking about one room. That one room was called a hall. The centerpiece of the room was the fireplace. When they added a room, this was so interesting to me, when they added a room, it was either on the other side of the fireplace or above the fireplace, which is logical because you want to maximize the heat and light from the fire. But this second room, often called the keeping room, which I understand is meant to refer to keeping warm around the fire, but the second room was often a parlor. So going from one room where everything was done, where you slept, where you cooked, where you relaxed, whatever relaxation they had in their hard scrabble lives, when you had the opportunity to build a second room, the choice for many of those early colonists was to build a parlor. The parlor was the room in which they entertained guests and which they displayed their finest possessions. So again, when we think about the history of houses, we have to say, we talked about the influence of politics and values on shaping the outside of the house. Here, we're talking about social values and valuing the idea of being a good host and showing off your finest wares influenced them enough that if they only had two rooms, one room was saved for company. So the exhibit doesn't go through all of the rooms in a house. It starts with the living room, it moves on to the kitchen, and it talks briefly about the bedroom. Let's start with the living room. The very name living room is interesting. It's an Americanism. When uh, we look at what this room is called in other parts of the English-speaking world, it's called the parlor, it's called the salon, it's called the sitting room. Only in, a, in the United States is it called the living room, and only was it called the living room in the late 1800s. And now you know that was no coincidence, because that was in the age of the Victorian era, when so much changed in the way that we lived. We have to remember that for centuries, if you said to someone, uh, let's make a room where we can take a, a time and go when we have some leisure time and just kind of hang out and be comfortable, they might not have known what you were talking about because first of all, they had little or no leisure time and the concept of comfort was uh, a foreign one to them. It wasn't really until the Victorians that, that most people, other than the very wealthy, were able to have upholstered furniture, uh, for example. So you have the living room emerging in the late uh, 1800s for the, for the middle class and for most people, not just the wealthy. As you look at the living room over those decades up till today, you realize the living room was really dominated by some center of entertainment. For the Victorians, that was the piano. The piano uh, was the central part of their uh, leisure time amusement. Young ladies were expected to know how to play it and to sing and to uh, entertain guests and family with the piano. Later on in the late 1800s, I think 1877, Edison invented the gramophone and the gramophone started to come into the living room and displace the piano, not completely, but certainly take its place as a source of entertainment. And then by the 1920s, you had the radio coming in. The first commercial radio station in the country was licensed in 1920. And we had those iconic pictures of the family sitting around looking at the radio. This radio that we have on display in, in the exhibit is an interesting one because those buttons across the top of it include one that says television. And this was, uh, as I said, the 20s were the really introduction of radio. The 30s were the, were the decade of the golden age of radio. Television was introduced at the 1939 World's Fair. 
So for at least two decades, you had more, many, many more people having uh, radio and then television. Uh, some of the early adapters had television in the 1940s, and then by the 1950s, almost every family had a TV. But this radio has a television button for those families probably in the early 40s who didn't yet have a television but could tune in the frequency on which the TV t stations were broadcasting and listen to their favorite television program. Programs. And that wasn't as strange as it seems because those early television programs were largely just radio programs that were adapted to video. Television comes in and the television kind of dominates our social life in our living room up until today, probably. And uh, we had a little example of a TV dinner here because you know, there's this dilemma. You were sitting in the living room watching TV and your know, dinner was ready in the kitchen, so what do you do? And the answer was, was given to you by Swanson, who invented the TV dinner. So we have that concept of the 1950s family coming into the living room to watch their favorite shows and eating their frozen Swanson TV dinner. We move on from the living room to the kitchen. And the kitchen of all of the rooms is probably the one whose functionality has remained the same, which you may question uh, when you think of the bedroom. But we'll, we'll get to that later, and I hope I have a chance to convince you that the bedroom has, in fact, changed quite a bit. But the kitchen is where we prepare food and often eat food, but it's basically preparing food that's been done there for centuries, and it's been basically done in the same way. The gadgets have changed what has power the gadgets has changed, but basically we're still doing the same chopping, cutting, frying, baking, sizzling, and eating that we've done uh, since, since the beginning. A lot of the material on this particular part of the exhibit is Victorian, and if you remember, um, I promised you that the Victorians could never have enough. They had something, they had invented and, and manufactured a gadget for every conceivable purpose in the kitchen. They had a gadget, which we have an example of, to seed raisins, to pod peas, to slice string beans, to do everything and, that we can imagine and beyond. And uh, it's just kind of fun to see that, that their proclivity for uh, decoration went even into the kitchen extended into the dining room. If you, if you know anything about Victorian dining rooms, they had all kinds of, of forks and knives and spoons, each for a different kind of shellfish or, or vegetable. And it's just, again, typical of what we know about them. And then finally, we're going to move on to the bedroom. I promised you that I was going to make a case that the bedroom was a room that had changed significantly, uh, but I postulated that it was the kitchen that was the least changed. So let me get to that case right now. When I was doing the research for this exhibit and I was reading about the bedroom, I was very moved because I realized that for many decades, the bedroom was the place where children were born and where the old and the infirm died. And so it was a place that had an emotional dimension that we can't even imagine now. I read that most people died in their beds. It was before hospitalization. It was before maternity wards. Babies were born at home and in, their be in the parents' bedroom. The person who took to their bed uh, on average died within three days. So the whole concept of hospice is, is a 21st or a late 20th century concept. So in that dimension, the bedroom has changed, just in terms of its emotional collateral. But there are other ways in which it's changed, too, because you notice that I did not choose to introduce you to the bathroom, because the bathroom was a latecomer in the history of houses. It's a late 19th century, early 20th century phenomenon. So for many, many decades and centuries even, if, there were, if a family were lucky enough to have a room that was dedicated for sleeping, a bedroom, the bedroom also served as the bathroom. And we have a bowl and pitcher here and a chamber pot to illustrate that, um, again, there was not much privacy. And in the bedroom, you woke up in the morning, you got your water from the well and poured it into the bowl, and perhaps with cold water, did what you brushed your teeth or washed your face or shaved. It was very clear to me in doing the research that uh, the kind of hygiene and sanitation that we're used to in the 21st century would have been 
been totally foreign to people even in the 19th century and certainly before that. So we will move on then from the bedroom to the next section of the exhibit. We've talked about the role of politics and the role of technology and the role of social pressures and our values in, how, in shaping the exterior and interior of our home. In this part of the exhibit, we look specifically at the role of technology because its impact was so profound. And specifically, we look at the big three, sanitation and running water, um, electricity, and, in, and uh, central heating. So we look first at sanitation. Um, I found this wonderful cover of Scientific American from uh, 1885, and it, what it is is an illustration of the sanitation system, the sewer system, under the streets of Brooklyn, uh, which was contracted for starting, I think, in about uh, 1847, if I remember, and I'm sure it took decades to finish. It was the country's first modern so, uh, sanitation system, which meant that there was a, the, the, the designer actually calculated based on anticipated need uh, and figured out the size of pipes and, and all of the mechanisms that were needed to make it work. But my favorite part, when I look at this poster, I remember a story that I want to share with you because I was on um, the internet doing my, part of my research and I came across a website that had advertised this poster for sale. So I emailed to the person who ran the website and asked if the poster were still available before I sent him my money, and if in fact it would arrive in time for the opening of the exhibit. And he emailed me back, oh, I explained the exhibit to him, and I told him it was about the history of houses and how fascinated I was with the role of technology in influencing how we lived at home. And he wrote back to me, and, and he told me uh, that yes, it, I, it was still available, and yes, it would be there in time, and how fun that I was doing this exhibit, and that he in fact was a sewer historian and that he had all kinds of other material that he would be able to share with me. And then we started this email correspondence in which he began to educate me on the role of running water and sanitation and sewer systems in American history. And I said to him, who would have ever thought that I would find a sewer maven just when I needed him? <laughs> so um, he, he was going to be a consultant on the plumbers convention in Atlantic City, I think, this year. But I don't think he ever made it in time to see the exhibit before it comes down next week. But maybe this video will help him see what he missed. He explained to me that running water came into the home first, that the first innovation was running water. Water was coming into the homes originally in the oldest incarnation through wooden pipes. Not a good idea, open and subject to, to rot and weathering. Uh, later they were put into pipes, which was a good idea. And then with the steam engine, of course, the, first of all, wind power moved the water and distributed it. Later on, it was steam power that delivered water to the house. And I believe that it was really the, the fear of fire that precipitated the early onset of of municipal public water systems into homes because fire was a major hazard to these wooden close together houses and the fire departments would come and, uh, and struggle to put out a fire without available water. So I think that the first water systems were motivated by the need to protect the property and get water there for the fire department. The first water that came into the home was pumped into the kitchen. Now I've learned all of this from my sewer maven, so I'm sure that, that this is correct. And he said that it came into the kitchen and, and it was a, certainly a boon to, to preparing food and washing food and bathing and all of that stuff. You didn't know, you no longer had to go to the well to, to carry the water into the house. But the, they then had to dispose of all this water that was now abundant and in, in their kitchens and they carried their wastewater out to their outhouses and dumped it and that all of this excess water was beginning to undermine the land under the outhouses and that precipitated the need for the sewer system and, and public sewers. And when we talk about water systems and sewer systems and electrification, we really have to make a distinction between rural America and uh, cities and, and better and more densely populated areas. I mean, the truth of the matter is that it wasn't until the New Deal in the 30s that much of the country even got outhouses. I think one of FDR's uh, projects was to install outhouses in, in the 1930s. I think I read that in 
1950, 25% of the homes in the United States still did not have a flushing toilet. So what we think of now as just so commonplace was really within probably not our memories, but our parents' and grandparents' memories of being a truly uh, profound innovation. I, I also discovered that there were uh, several polls of doctors, surveys of doctors, in which they were asked, what single innovation in human history has had the most profound effect on our health? And you might think that they would say penicillin. What they said was the flushing toilet, because it took us an embarrassingly long time as a civilization to figure out the relationship between germs and disease. And it took, because of that, uh, wastewater was still being pumped and dumped into drinking supplies well into the late um, 19th century. Sanitation, although it's, it's great fun for sixth grade boys to talk about, is really an important thing for us to remember when we begin to appreciate the history of how we live at home. The second thing I want to talk about is the electric light. We mentioned briefly when we were talking about the Victorian home what a breakthrough it was to be able to get rid of the, ga the dirt and the danger of the gas lights and to simply be able to turn on um, a switch and, and have electric light. And it was in fact electric light that was the first invention that made people fall in love with electricity. Uh, again, thinking about this as I was putting the exhibit together, it occurred to me that if today we were to go to our municipalities and say, you know, we have this wonderful idea for electricity and it's going to change our lives, but in order to do it, we have to put these poles up about every 50 feet or 50 yards, whatever they are, and we're going to string these wires, and yes, they are dangerous, and if they do fall, you know, they could electrocute somebody. I mean, there's no way today that I think the public would um, tolerate the building of the infrastructure that was required to electrify the country, never mind the power plants. But I think they were so hungry for electric light and so wowed by its potential that they supported financially and politically the building of the infrastructure. And in addition to, to, to building the first practical electric light bulb, it was really uh, Edison's genius to put together the first electrical system to deliver the electricity to the home. And once the electric grid was in place, the floodgate was opened, and that really started that rush of electric irons and uh, refrigerators and electric stoves and all vacuums and all of the things that we think of now were made possible because the country fell in love with the electric light, was willing to electrify the country, and therefore produce the power that enabled all of those innovations. And again, both the sanitation and the electrification, uh, or the electric light anyway, are happening in that Victorian era. And then the last thing is this idea of central heat, which again we talked about during when we were looking at the Victorian house model, uh, and realizing that the radiator and the the idea of having a, a system that could pump heat into all of these rooms really enabled there to be all of these rooms and enabled comfort and changed even the way we dress. We, we no longer had to dress to stay warm in our own houses. Um, and again, introduced the idea of privacy. You know, if only I had known, I remember in whatever grade it was, sixth or seventh grade, learning about James Watt and the invention of the steam engine and thinking, you know, like, well, that's nice, but never really understanding um, um, at the level that I do now, how significantly that steam engine was able to power the Industrial Revolution, the water that was piped into the, to our homes, the heat that was piped through the pipes to the radiators in our home, the trains that brought, delivered all of these goods to everybody. I mean, it really revolutionized domestic life. Uh, the pot belly stove is here because uh, for centuries fire was our source of heat and light. Fire, of course, was a tremendous hazard to homes, but it was also inefficient and dirty. 
Um, Franklin himself invented the Franklin stove, a form of iron stove that uh, I think fit into his fit into the fireplace. It was improved over the years. This potbelly stove was was not until the 19th century. But it, the potbelly stove and the iron stove had a tremendous advantage because you could retrofit it into different rooms, so you didn't have to have a fireplace in a room to make it warm. And it radiated heat, and it radiated heat on its whole three. 360 degree radius. So uh, it was until the invention of central heating and the radiator a real breakthrough in comfort in, in the American home. So again, uh, on the front of the table, uh, you'll see little cards which you can't read, but I can. So I'll, I'll let you know that it highlights what were the innovations in each of these eras. And, and if you look at it, the blue ribbon is on the Victorian era because everything that I've just discussed happened in those 75 or so years. The last part of our exhibit really takes the history of houses and takes a hometown look at them. And what we have here are some of the marketing materials and design plans and subdivision plans for the houses that are right here in Ocean Township. And one of the things that we saw is what were the political, social, technological forces that made Ocean Township look the way it looks today in terms of its housing stock. And for many centuries, we were, like most of Monmouth County, just a sleepy farm town community settled mostly by Quakers and Baptists seeking religious freedom, coming from New England for the most part, and farming this land. Of course, the little village where they went for their general store and their grist mill, etc. So what happened to make it the suburb that we see today? I think one of the most profound changes was the Second World War. After the war, you had the returning GI the GI Bill, you had Levitt building houses on Long Island and in Pennsylvania, really kind of mass producing houses the way that the Industrial Revolution had mass produced all the goods that we've talked about. The Levitt brothers really invented a way to mass produce houses and we had that same kind of technology coming here. So in the 40s, after the war, you have the automobile bringing people from the cities, the returning GIs deciding not to return to the city but to look elsewhere, the GI Bill giving them the money to be able to afford to buy a house, and the Levitt technology allowing the mass production of neighborhoods. We have the Brower houses in Wanamassa is an example of this kind of mass production of houses. Uh, you had this, the coastal towns of Asbury Park and Long Branch, which had been in the 19th century attractive um, resorts to the rich and famous, being built up, and then you had kind of people coming in being wanting to be near the ocean, unable to afford or not able to find properties in Deal and Asbury and Long Branch and moving further west into Ocean Township. And you'll notice that on some of this material they talk about the homes in North Asbury Park or they talk about the places in Elberon Park and they're using the names of these classy, expensive, coastal resort towns to bring some cachet to the developments that were going up in, in Ocean Township. Another thing that had uh, an effect on the development of the town was the 1990, 1919 entry of what we know now as Bell Labs, but was then the Western Electric Research Arm in what we call now Joe Play Park, was called then Deal Test Site, and it brought in an, uh, an influx of scientists and workers who needed housing stock. So the housing that I live in and in, in the area of Oakhurst where I live was built largely in response to the needs of, of the Bell Labs workers. This table also shows us the Sears house kits. We have a, a number of homes in town that were built from kits that were ordered from the Sears and Roebuck catalog, delivered on railroad, and assembled according to a, a, a very detailed book. Every piece of the kit was marked with a number, and the instructions for constructing it were in the little booklet. And we have lots of examples of those. Very pretty, very detailed, very lovely homes. And the final thing, and perhaps my favorite on this table, we have some evidence of um, a promotion that was done by the uh, newspaper, the Newark Star Eagle. If you subscribe to the New York Star Eagle for a whole year, 
you were given a lot in Oakhurst for free. That was kind of your bonus for your newspaper subscription. So we have some examples of the deeds and the agreements. And uh, we still have evidence. It, it, later on, many of these very slim lots were consolidated by new owners. But there are still some examples in Oakhurst of those very thin lots with kind of railroad little cottages on them that were examples of the giveaway from the Newark uh, Star Eagle. So that kind of concludes all that we had to show you about this exhibit, which will be coming down shortly. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you will come into the Eden Woolley house in the upcoming weeks because we'll have a brand new exhibit. It's called Fashion, the History of What We Wear, and it does kind of for clothing what this exhibit did for housing. It kind of takes a look not just at what we wear, but why we wear it, what were the influences on it. Um, we are an all-volunteer organization, and we welcome your visit, we welcome your participation, and we thank you for your attention.